Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters, weekly markets checklist week 138. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. What do we have this week, Keith? Well, before we get going, some housekeeping. We will be having, by popular request, Portfolio Matters Christmas drinks on Tuesday, the 5th of December. Venue to be confirmed, but please put the date in your diary. In addition, there will be no Portfolio Matters next week because I'm hiking in the Lake District, but we will be back week after. The news. Well, Saudi Arabia and Russia reiterated their commitment to oil supply cuts, causing a very brief rally in the oil price. But then oil had a shocking week and fell heavily. We will show you the data later. WeWork has gone bust in possibly the most predictable bankruptcy in history. SoftBank have lost 16 billion. The uh, bond and equity rally continued until last night when there was a poor auction of US 30-year bonds causing a big spike in bond yields. And Jay Powell also gave a hawkish speech to the IMF in which he stated that it was not clear whether US interest rates were yet high enough to tame inflation. And China has slipped back into deflation. So the Chinese economy is does not appear to be doing terribly well. And numbers out this morning, UK third quarter GDP beat expectations at zero. So not great, but better than the contraction that people had been fearing. So some charts. Well, this is current um, interest rate expectations. And you can see that the market is expecting cuts starting around mid next year. And this was the action in the bond market yesterday, where you know, we had a poorly received 30 year auction and then Jay Powell speech. And US 30 year yields got an enormous 15 basis points, which is shocking. So the strong rally in bond prices has come to a, a an abrupt end as of yesterday so previously the rally in bond prices and the fall in yields had caused financial conditions to loosen slightly so this is the san francisco fed's proxy funds rate which measures real interest rates in the economy and you can see that in 2021, it was actually negative, and then it's zoomed up to 7%, but it's since come off to around 6.5%. So that loosening is visible, but the backdrop is an enormous tightening in monetary policy, and that will have an effect with long and variable lags. So on Twitter, there's various talk about how financial conditions had, tight, had loosened and therefore uh, the Fed would have to raise interest rates again. Well, I just don't think that's very likely because the backdrop is still an enormous tightening in interest rates. And WeWork has gone bust. Uh, at its peak, it was worth $47 billion, according to, to SoftBank. And what I think this shows is just how delusional some um private equity like venture capital valuations can be so this um graphic gives um uh, quite an entertaining history of we work pause and take a look okay and on to this week's economic data the uk richard thank you keith so as keith said uk quarter or quarter gdp growth was better than expected <laughs> not much more to say really is there yeah, and, uh, year on year uh, growth is um, also better than expected. So maybe all the doom says we've proven completely wrong. Yeah, 0.6%, Richard, that will teach them. We're on a tear. 
government economic policy. Yes. Um, uh, UK construction orders down, continuing to, um, <laughs> that's like down a lot. Yeah. No. Okay. So this chart, for some reason, has not updated. So it contains data to Q2, but not data for Q3. And you'll see that now we've had quarter on quarter, mm. three quarters in a row of very steep drops in construction orders. Why did anyone think, why were consensus ex consensus expectations up when we all know what's going on in the, in the in the commercial property market, never mind the housing market? Yeah, but the thing is, Richard, if you compound yeah, 14% by 17% minus 20%, you get a huge drop yeah. and you know probably the consensus was thinking it just can't keep on dropping like this yeah possibly so keith that is a massive slowdown uh, actually we don't have a chart for this okay. but i thought it was interesting anyway so the business investment environment appears to have deteriorated significantly in quarter three down 4.2 percent and uh, uk gdp growth month on month uh, some, 0.2 um percent and that was better than consensus as well yeah we shall see whether that uk and, and uk gdp growth year on year um 1.3 percent in september but if month on month in august was 0. in september 0.2 how can year on year be something something bad must have dropped out of yeah but also you you know we've just reported that the um using the quarterly data that uk gdp growth was 0.6 percent in the year to end q3 yeah. and this the monthly data is saying 1.3 percent so that's that's a big difference Isn't it the numbers are, are not consistent yeah. uk economic statistics discuss uk manufacturing output was a little bit positive uh, month on month in september but below expectations and manufacturing output year on year up three percent, um, which actually is, is okay. And in UK industrial output month on month at zero, so it's fair, that's pretty sluggish. And industrial output year on year up one and a half percent. Um, so you know, better than a kick in the teeth, as my dad would have said. Yeah. UK balance of trade. Actually, it is on a little bit of an improving trend, I think, at the moment, isn't it? It's not great, and um, yeah. definitively not great. But Well, I interpret that to mean that the UK economy is doing badly, Richard. The only time we have better um, trade statistics is when we stop uh, buying imports, basically, because the economy is doing badly. <laughs> the UK global construction PMI is uh, f continuing to fall. And, um, and mind you, that's not in, um, it's not as disastrous as the, um, what was that figure we looked at with the, the new orders? Yeah. yeah. So, well, presumably that means that people are still working through a large construction backlog. Yeah. But we also have the breakdown here. And you'll see that um, housing activity is poor and deteriorating, and the worst it's been actually outside of the pandemic on this yeah. chart. And the uh, UK retail sales year on year, a reasonably healthy 2.6%. The Halifax House Price Index, so up for the first time in six months. And um, of course, yeah. well, I think that house builders have stopped building, haven't they? So the, the supply of, or not or significantly curtailed, the supply of new, proper, new houses coming onto the market. I suspect that is now squeezing the market yeah no i think that's true richard but actually just before we move on the um retail sales numbers those are nominal so yeah. rather than real oh, they're not good then are they so they're not great so that means we in real terms they're down yeah and uh, the month on month house price index just ticking up a little bit there so talking about the um house price index uh, which has obviously bounced. Uh, one of our Discord members, Wayne J, has pointed out that if 
the house price index just takes the average of houses, the price of houses sold, then changes in the distribution of houses sold can create misleading results. So in particular, because better off people with cash tend to continue buying homes during a recession, whereas poor people um, with lower resources stop buying homes. And so you get a redistribution of house sales to whereby more expensive houses keep on being sold, whereas there's a drop in activity at the lower end of the market. And if we think about a theoretical economy where there are only two houses, there's an expensive one at £10 and a cheap one at £5. In year one, both of them are sold. And so the average house price sold is £7.50, the average of the two. In year two, the price of both houses falls by 20%. So the expensive one falls to £8. The cheaper one falls to £4. But the cheaper one doesn't get sold. The, the expensive one is sold. And therefore, the average of house prices sold is eight pounds. Basically, beware. Um, depends on how the house price index is constructed, and it can give misleading results. Now, we know the Case Shiller house price index in the US compares the sale price of houses that have originally been sold. So, the current price it's been sold at versus the last time it was sold. So, it gets rid of this problem, but it's not clear that other. Um, House price indices do. The UK house price. What is the house price balance, Keith? I've not heard of this before. Um, so it is the World Institute of Chartered Surveyors. What uh, proportion of them, the number which are reporting house prices going down versus the number of prices reporting uh, oh. number going up. So far more are reporting house price falls than rises, basically. Which contradicts the... Um... Yeah, the <laughs> the monthly data. There you go. Um, and the uh, UK BBA mortgage rate, oh gosh, eight percent. Yeah, that's the standard variable rate. Wow, that's that is quite chunky, actually. Yeah, but I don't think many people actually no. pay the variable rate. You try and immediately get a fixed rate. Yeah, and uh, UK productivity. It is a very depressing chart that we see from time to time, and UK productivity has stagnated really for the last 15 years or more and it's yeah depressing, isn't it that's a shocking number actually of course yeah I, I, unfortunately it sort of coincides more or less with the arrival of the conservative run of conservative governments doesn't it really well 2010 was that because they've been in power for 13 years right. mm. yes economic, economic mismanagement Dot, dot, mm. dot. We know we've had that. Uh, UK business investment has grown after a period of stagnation, but it's now falling. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> so, in summary, we really haven't got a clue, have we? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no, I, I, so, uh, I mean, I think I think the UK is actually quite rapidly falling into recession now is my sense with this data we shall see mm. well uh, i think the falling construction orders and business investment suggest things are going to get worse yeah yeah i don't think it's going to be i don't think it's going to be slow i think i think it's one of these things that once it gets going it's going to be very rapid i think the you know, same thing um, i'm fairly fairly uh, gloomy about it actually right okay thank you richard <laughs> On to the EU. Well, I'll go and take my antidepressants now, Keith. Mm. And um, this is the EU unemployment rate, which ticked up to 6.5%, but is still at record lows. So, you know, despite a slowing EU economy, the labour market there remains very tight. Mm. Uh, construction PMI, just terrible, frankly. Um, 
It was expected at a pretty dreadful 44.4, but it fell further to 42.7, which is just about the lowest it's been ever, apart from during the pandemic. Producer price inflation in the Eurozone ticked up by 0.5% in September, but year on year down 12.4%. So if PPI leads CPI, and we've had this debate before, then CPI should continue falling. And we believe it probably does by about a month. So EU retail sales, and these are real. So this is the change in volume of goods sold, not the value, fell 0.3% in September, which was worse than expectations. But the August number was revised up from a previously utterly dreadful minus 1.2% to a still very poor minus 0.7%. So the Eurozone retail sales are not doing well. The Citigroup uh, Economic Surprise Index for the EU was largely unchanged last week, at minus 45, i.e. not great. So in summary, the Eurozone economy does not look like it's doing very well. The construction sector is in deep recession, but the labour market remains tight and the ECB is likely to keep interest rates high until there's at least some evidence of some slack in the labour market and falling inflationary pressures. And on to the US, Richard. So uh, US non-farm payroll, quite a significant revision downwards in September. 100, about 150k in October against 180 uh, expectations. So worse than expected. Um, but if you look at the uh, the graph, the um, it's still looking quite healthy, I would say, isn't it, Keith? Um, Yeah, I mean, still, the economy is still definitely creating jobs. But if we go through this, I think there are concerns about the quality of those jobs. Right. So government payrolls, 51,000. Gosh, why is, why, how can government payrolls be better if they're bigger? (laughs) <laughs> Doesn't that mean the government's getting bigger? Doesn't yeah. that mean that's bad and that well, it's actually worse? Sorry, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm just sort of saying that the logic, in terms of, from from my point of view, economic competence is the wrong way around. Mm, <laughs> true. So, uh, anyway, look, the government is creating loads of jobs, although not as many as they thought last month. Mm. And uh, private payrolls aren't. Uh, are, I mean, it's still quite. It, it's still creating jobs, aren't they? Not at the rate they were at the beginning of the year, but it's still um, a little yeah. slow down. And construction sector continued to add jobs in October. Bizarre. And we, you know, the normal path of recession is that the property market, the housing market leads, and um, residential construction payrolls drop around the time of the recession. So that is not happening at the moment. No, it's not. And, you know, the strength of the U.S. housing market we've covered many times is just uh, continues to be uh, mystifying. Mm. So it's if we're going to have recession, it's not going to follow the normal path because uh, construction activity has just held up much better than uh, we anticipated. Yeah. Cyclical versus non-cyclical jobs growth. So the non so education health considered to be non-cyclical i guess isn't it because basically yeah. those are services that are provided throughout the economic cycle so you take non-farms and take off education and health and you can see that actually that is falling quite fast it's still above zero but it is falling quite fast yeah and so when we you were saying earlier about uh the jobs market being healthy it is but it is fading yeah and uh, non far payrolls have been revised downwards every month this year, except July. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, this is your point, Richard, about the manipulation of government statistics. So we know that the non farm payrolls contain a lot of modelling, particularly in the form of the business birth and death model. And 
it seems that systematically this year they have overestimated the creation of new companies and the employment therein. I mean, I'm not suggesting that for a minute that they do this, Keith, but clearly if you have a good number, then you say, sorry, last month's number wasn't as good as we thought, but this month's number is good. Um, and you, you operate in that sequence, you can, in fact, you could, if you wished to, manipulate the um, <laughs> the market. Uh, I mean, it, interesting as a theoretical sort of concept. Mm, mm. So the household survey is showing a drop in employment of 348,000, and uh, that's quite a, quite a chunky drop. Yeah. And is the household survey more accurate? Well, we don't know, do we? But, you know, interesting the the extent of the divergence between the two. Yeah, it's a big divergence, isn't it? So the one month change in temporary help um, has rose slightly. So um, temporary help is, I don't know, what, what's the significance of this to the economy? Well, the thing is, it's the, the easiest people to get rid of are the temps, temp staff. And so the fact that, you know, previously we've talked about how the falling um, temporary em employment meant that the jobs market was slowing well it bounced back in october it, but temporary staff employment is down 6.1 percent year on year and it isn't it, it on quite a strong downtrend isn't it mm. overtime hours i think that's quite significant is, is dropping yeah it's a very long time period this which is quite interesting and it's actually if you ignore covid and the gfc it's the lowest it's been since 1990 yeah Permanent job loss is picking up, but are at quite low levels. And uh, they're up 27% year on year. Yeah, so but it's a bit of a swizz, though, comparing it, you know, year on year, when actually, when you look at the absolute levels, they're yeah. pretty low. Yeah. And the number of full-time jobs rose by 326,000 in October, according to the St. Louis Fed. Yeah. So previously, we talked about how... They'd been dropping despite the fact um, employment had been rising. Well, October was a good month. Mm. And the EPB Research Coincident Employment Index fell. And that is looking quite a nasty. It is. Line. Yeah. And the uh, US unemployment rate is still just extraordinarily low. And average hourly earnings month on month rose 0.2%, which is like 3% annual roughly speaking yeah that's that is a really good number 0.2 percent but you'll see that other um wage indices have much worse numbers hmm. and uh, average hourly earnings year on year so slowly falling down and uh, that's just continuing that fall towards four percent and the atlanta wage growth tracker 5.2%, same as it was in September, but that's still on a downward trend. Yeah, but that's not a good number. You know, we've just seen the month-on-month -month number, 0.2%, but then, according to the uh, Bureau of Labour Statistics, but then the Atlanta Fed have a three-month average of 5.2%. Yeah. So that's much, much higher, and also it's just not coming down. So... You know, the Fed is likely to keep interest rates high until that number comes down to at least three and a half percent, i.e. Yeah. quite a lot lower than here. Yeah, good point, Keith. Uh, US weekly hours work is uh, sort of round about average level at the moment, isn't it? Maybe a little bit on the low side of the average mm. level, but it's a very fine scale. Yeah. And the employment participation rate is continuing to rise and it is now about what it was in the mid 2020s in the, sorry mm. in the mid 2010s yeah. just about getting there so that would be a full road covid recovery effectively and the ism services pmi nicely above 50 yeah but disappointing mm. and actually it is above 50 richard but the thing is you have to look at it relative to its average Yes. And it is far below its average. Yes, that's true, Keith. And services employment is well, it's at fifty. Is it's where basically it's where it's been. It's in that in that range it's been in since twenty twenty two. Yeah, it's not below fifty. 
No. Certainly, but it's neutral. Mm. Um, the ISM services business activity is, I mean, as Keith says, it's a little bit below where, where it was pre-COVID, but it's it's sort of in this range, isn't it, between 50 and 60? And unless it goes out of either of those two, it suggests all business mm. as usual. Yeah. So the new orders is um, it's on a slow, slowly descending path. Yeah, but actually better than expected, I'll tell you. Yeah. All these charts are quite noisy. ISM services prices is, uh, you know, it's sort of, well, it, it, it fell quickly. It reversed a little bit last mm. month, and now it's stabilised, I think. So yeah. US exports look like they're on a bit of a tear, and US imports are, I don't think that downtrend has been violated has it but mm. um yeah but interesting bounce in both in imports and exports in october yeah I guess the u.s economies had a bit of a bounce actually yeah mind you there's all that money coming in from the debt government debt mm. chips act inflation reduction act and whatever the other one was yeah u.s consumer credit month on month um positive though it was worse than expectations but Positive, significantly positive. Uh, we've heard about US used car prices month on month dropping. I I have to say, Keith, and you may you may tell me I'm totally wrong here, but I'm not quite sure why people get such, their knickers in such a twist about US used car prices. They're an important component of the CPI. Is it basically right? So there we are. US used car prices month on month down four percent. Yeah, so just showing that basically the um, you had an extraordinary spike in prices yeah. uh, post COVID, and that is continuing to fade, and that should bring inflation down. He says. The U.S. Logistics Managers Index. Everyone was terribly depressed about U.S. Logistics a couple of months ago. Now look at it. Fire yeah. Back upwards. No, absolutely amazing. Because it hit all time lows. Yeah. You know, only three months ago, and now it's bounced back really strongly. Uh, retail sales. Are um, well, it's difficult to say, isn't it? They are actually fairly healthy, around about four percent. Yeah. Now, I'm I was actually puzzled by this, Richard, because that is a big drop in one week. So last week is five point three percent year year on year. This week it's three point one. Yeah, but I and, think if you look at that, if you look at the the from, say from January, there there have been moves that size all the way through. Yeah. I, that, I just think this noisy chart, Keith. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, it is a big drop, but it's also a noisy chart. Yeah. But, so I looked into how this was constructed. Right. And they're saying it's sales weighted year over year. So if you just compare sales this week with the exact same week last week, I would expect this chart to be even noisier than it is. So... I'd like to know more about how exactly they construct it. The um, 30 year mortgage rate, it's just um, at its all time high, give or take. Mm. Not its all time high, its recent high. Yeah. Tick down a bit, but not much. Yeah. Mortgage market index, I think it's continuing to fall, isn't it? Well, well no, it's actually risen slightly. Picked up, but you know, pretty much at its all time low. Yeah. Initial jobless claims, I would say this is just a stable month on month fluctuations. Yeah. And actually, no sign of an acceleration mm. in job losses. Yeah. And continuing jobless claims. Now, they are starting to look a little bit unhealthy. Yeah. So, what seems to be happening, Richard, is that. People who lose their job can't get a new one, but there is has been no acceleration in job losses. Yeah. So you are seeing this steady rise in unemployment, but without actually any acceleration in job losses yet. Yeah. And uh, continuing claims are actually looking pretty stable there. Yeah, so 30% year-on-year increase in claims, but no acceleration. Yeah. 
and the economic surprise index is looking surprisingly good. Yep. There should be a derivative, isn't there? There should be a first derivative of the economic surprise. Have <laughs> <laughs> we made up all the world's in surprise indices? Yeah. I wonder what that, I wonder if that would be surprising. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the Atlanta Fed GDP now last week one point two percent, this week two point one percent. I mean, I just say if this is that volatile, you've got to question the accuracy of it. Yeah, I agree. But you know, looking pretty healthy. Yeah. So, I mean, the U.S. labor market does look as if it's weakening a bit. Wage growth is slowing, long-term unemployment is rising, but there's you know there's a bit of contradictory data knocking around as well. The ISM non-manufacturing PMIs were, were disappointing and suggest that that might be weakening. The claim account isn't elevated, little sign the economy is slowing, and GDP looks like it's fairly robust. So I think the jury is still out on this. And I still think that they will go into a recession. Yeah, well, so do, I think the economy is slowing, but very slowly. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, very little um, indication that the recession is imminent. And on to China. So very little information from China this week, just the inflation numbers. And China has gone back into deflation. So the month on month was minus 0.1%. And year on year, minus 0.2%. So supply greater than demand in China. Not evidence that uh, the uh, Chinese economy is still not doing great. Yeah. And on to one chart. Now, we've talked about the impact of the IRA and CHIPS acts, And if you look at non-residential investment growth in the US, <clears throat> it has made a big contribution to um, investment. So the TAN bars are structures investment related to the IRA and CHIPS Act. And you can see that it has supported economic growth in the US this year, and that will continue for years to come. Mm. Now, last week, I presented this chart and I asked viewers to send in any information they had about European oil demand, because this chart would suggest that European oil demands fallen 12% this year, which just seems enormous. So thank you to Orange Cannon for sending me a Bloomberg report. And actually, it looks like it's plausible. So European naphtha demand is expected to have fallen by 25% since 2019. Now, naphtha is mainly used in the petrochemicals industry, but that suggests a big drop in European um, chemicals production. And elsewhere in the Bloomberg report, they said that French diesel demand had fallen 13% in the year to September. They didn't give any other numbers but they reported that diesel demand fell in all of europe's top five economies france germany uk spain and italy so the 12 percent we showed in that chart last week appears plausible and that is an enormous drop and of course oil had a very bad week is that road transport do you think a big drop in diesel demand well, it must be. It suggests that, you know, lot far fewer goods and services moving around the economy. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Which contradicts some of the other data. Yeah. Well, it suggests that, you know, the, the European economy is slowing far faster than yeah. the headline numbers suggest. Yeah. And on to the quarterly U.S. Senior Loan Origination Officers Survey, Richard. Thank you, Keith. Well said. This shows the change in tightening effectively by these senior loan officers and the they've tightened been tightening very rapidly and the the rate of tightening is now falling, but it's still positive. So loan conditions are still getting tighter, but not as quickly as they were. And uh, credit spreads for commercial industrial loans have increased, 
are still increasing. But again, that is the rate of increase has slowed down to an extent. And non-domestic respondents reporting stronger demand for commercial and industrial loans. So there's still a slowing demand for these commercial and industrial loans from um but the uh, the rate of slowdown is reducing. The uh, tightening for um, commercial real estate loans, the rate of tightening of that is also slowing, but only very, very slightly. And the, um, I think, yeah, I think, I suspect, yeah, you know, they, they must be getting very, very twitched about commercial, particularly commercial real estate. Those respondents reporting stronger demand for commercial real estate loans. So there's still declining demand for commercial real estate loans, but it's not declining as fast as it was. Um, so the left-hand chart here shows actually that uh, net, there's been a loosening of lending standards for residential mortgages. Probably because the um, residential property market appears to be holding up very well. Um, yeah, it, well, it does. But the demand has fallen. So their banks are reporting that they are loosening standards, but getting fewer customers, basically. And uh, consumer credit is continuing to tighten. So this, this is showing the top chart shows the percentage of um, banks willing to make consumer installment loans. And basically, they don't like doing it. And they are still very unwilling to make consumer installment loans. And uh, the respondents, the banks are effectively reporting stronger demand for consumer loans. Well, none of them are. They're all reporting weaker demand for consumer loans. So people aren't asking for them. They don't, the banks don't want to give them. Yeah. Which, which is, which is um, nobody wants to borrow because the interest rates are too high and the banks don't want to lend because they think they might not get their money back. Yeah. So why is the US economy so strong? mystifying inflation reduction act and we saw it in that chart didn't we yeah without the inflation reduction act and the chips act the um that chart would have been the one with the block the blocks would have been severely negative and that's the debt it's, it's a debt funded uh, economy mm. and um you know it's a was it chuck prince said i'm still dancing yeah that's true so they, yeah. they're still dancing until they can't dance until the um Music stops. Yeah. US credit conditions continue to tighten, but at a slower pace, but they are still tightening, which means that the real economy, as opposed to the government funded economy, is slowing. Mm. Okay, now we have a big section coming up. Now, last week, we were discussing Japan, and I said that. <laughs> The uh, failure of Japan to create inflation was evidence that an aging population is deflationary. And one of our Discord members, Mr. C. Peckham, got in touch to say that was wrong, that he thought that aging populations were actually inflationary. And I have had a look at the data and read a few papers this week. And I'm afraid he may well be right. So I've had to change my opinion on the effect of aging on inflation. Now, reminder, developed economies are getting older. So the yellow line is Japan, but you know the red line is China and the gray line is us. We are all getting older. The, the populations are aging. And what effect will that have on inflation and other economic metrics? Well, the life cycle hypothesis says that aging is actually inflationary rather than deflationary. So young workers just starting out on their careers they have to borrow and spend more than they make because they need to um, buy a house, get married, have children, and they borrow from the future 
to invest in setting up their homes. So their demand uh, exceeds their income. Then as they get older, they start to save for retirement. And so their saving exceeds their um, everyday expenses. So that is deflationary. Then as they get older and retire, so they cease con um, contributing to the economy and they start consuming their savings. And so their supply of work to the economy is zero, but they still continue to consume. And so their demand exceeds their supply, and that is inflationary. So demographics are expected to mean young populations are inflationary, middle-aged populations are deflationary, old age populations are inflationary once again. So an aging population, according to the life cycle hypothesis, should be inflationary. So why an aging population potentially is inflationary is that an aging population increases the dependency ratio. So workers produce more than they consume. Non-workers by definition, consume more than they produce. High, hence, a higher dependency ratio means demand is greater than supply, and that is inflationary. And as the working age population declines relative to the elderly population, so the elderly need to bid up for the uh, work of the remaining population. And so and that increases the pricing power of labor, leading to real wage rises. Pause, have a read. Now, but there are also good reasons why an aging population could be disinflationary or deflationary. So retirees favor price stability to protect the value of their savings. And therefore, they can be expected to vote for policies that will promote their best interests and low inflation. They are also dependent on their savings. And if inflation rises and they see the value of their savings begin to erode, they will spend less. And so demand will fall. And so and so aging populations will suffer from structurally low demand. In addition, although they require more health care, those expenditures are financed by the state, not by them. And so whether the you get inflation or deflation will in part depend on how the state funds those health care costs. If they do it by increasing the fiscal deficit, then that could well be inflationary. If they cut other expenditure, then it needn't necessarily be. And finally, and this is a big effect, companies will expect lower growth and therefore they will reduce investment. And the although the labor supply will fall, labor so production is not just a function of labor it's a function of capital and machinery and the total stock of machinery does not fall and will increase with investments so the supply of goods and services will not fall as fast as labor and therefore although demand falls supply does not fall as fast and therefore prices may fall now, Oxford economics think that aging is deflationary. And on the y-axis, you have inflation. And on the x-axis, you have output. And what they're saying is aging reduces output, but reduces inflation as well. And if you look at the dark blue line here, this is Oxford Economics forecast of how consumption changes with age. And you'll see, and this makes total sense, as people age, they consume steadily less and less. 
Now, the red line is their consumption plus healthcare. And the question is, how is that healthcare funded? If it's funded by increasing the deficit, then that could be inflationary. If it's funded by um, cutting other expenditure, then it needn't be. Now, this is really interesting. Okay, so this is a regression analysis showing the relationship between inflation and the dependency ratio on the x-axis. And you'll see that according to the regression line, aging populations are deflationary. However, the regression line works by minimizing the error between data points and the regression line and is a function of the square of the outliers. And so it's very influenced by extreme data points. So actually, if you remove Turkey, where inflation is not a function of an aging population, it's a function of very bad economic policy, and you remove J Japan, I would say there's really not much relationship at all. Also, I think you, what you could do, Keith, is you could more or less draw a straight line through the, the bottom uh, points and ignore anything above about four, and you could yeah. actually just say, well, they're, 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 out, they're outliers. You could pretty much do a straight line through those points. Yeah, so which would mean, basically, there's no relation between inflation and uh, ageing populations. And also a correlation of minus 0.5, you know, it's like, well... Yeah. And obviously Turkey. So, yeah, it is. Um... Although they do say that excluding Turkey, you still get a negative relationship. Yeah, but minus 0 0.5. I mean, it's, yeah. like, it's not a strong correlation. So the question is how an aging population changes the supply demand balance. If it's inflationary, then demand falls less than supply supply falls hard and you get more demand than supply and inflation deflation it's the other way around so the capital intensity of the economy increases supply does not fall as much as demand and you get deflation so the bottom line is the answer is not actually obvious um, population aging affects many variables and also policy is really important. So I think we can say from that chart that, you know, depends on how the government reacts. I've read various economic papers. If you look at papers which just look at Japan, data from Japan, the answer is always that an aging population equals deflation. So instead, I've tried to look for papers which look at cross-country data. So there's this paper from 2014, which looks at cross-country data, and that showed that aging populations are deflationary. And then there's another paper from 2018 that shows it is inflationary. And actually, they have this nice little chart here that shows pretty much the pattern we'd expect from the life cycle hypothesis. So Young people, inflationary, middle-aged, deflationary, elderly, inflationary. And then something odd happens. The very elderly are highly deflationary. And they finally, their money, don't they? well, they don't. Yeah, absolutely. They don't spend any money at all. But then finally, we have this paper from 2020, again, cross-country data looking at 24 countries from 1961 to 2014 and if you look at the numbers here this is the effect of inflation so p19 means population under 19 and that is deflationary working age young people who have higher demand that's inflationary uh, mature workers that's deflationary and then 
the elderly is inflationary, but notice that the very elderly here are very inflationary, which contradicts the last paper. So in summary, and I realize this has been a bit wonkish, but I think it's quite important. I see no reason to disagree with the EU, who basically said that uh, an aging population will create lower growth, undoubtedly, because you've got lower labor supply and productivity growth will be lower because the elderly consume more services than manufacturing and productivity growth is harder in services. It is likely to produce higher savings rates and lower interest rates because the demand for loans, etc., is also likely to fall. And finally, the effect on wages and trend inflation are not obvious. So they say that aging and a growing workforce is def deflationary. Aging and a declining workforce is inflationary. But you'll say that that is the combination that Japan has. And that Japan has had very strong deflation. So all that adds up to actually aging, not necessarily having a terribly strong effect on the economy and, you know, idiosyncratic effects such as in Japan, where Japan may well be still suffering the after effects of the bursting of their great asset bubble in the 1990s can swamp the effects of aging on inflation and um, other economic variables. So what do I think? Well, historically, I have been very taken by uh, the Japanese experience and the fact that an aging population there has been absolutely deflationary. But uh, now looking at the cross country comparisons and the life cycle hypothesis, I've changed my mind. I'm not sure. And I think that actually um, aging could well be inflationary, but th the effect is likely to be swamped by policy variables and decisions that governments make. If they decide to fund healthcare costs by um, increasing the fiscal deficit, then you're going to get inflation. Richard, at the end of that long and wonkish section, what do you think? Uh, so it's interesting, Keith. I mean, it's one of the factors, isn't it? It's the factor that we don't really quite understand. It's one of the factors that goes into inflation. My sense is that, you know, when you've retired, you, if you have money, you will you want to spend some of it. You're not producing, so that is going to be inflationary. So there's sort of it seems to, there is some common sense in it. Um, but as you rightly say, there are a whole load of other factors as well. I think the the problem is when people say because this economy has a demographic problem, therefore this will happen. And mm -hmm. I think that's those sort of one dimensional um, statements are quite, I think they're quite sort of misguided really, because there are so many factors that make up an economic and economy's behavior, including extern entirely external factors. And um, the sort of sim the simplistic approach of if then is, is um, I think it actually adds, it confuses Mm. People draw um, simplistic conclusions over what is a very complex, uh, very complex area. So, yeah, I just think it's yeah, it is one of the factors, Keith. But I don't, I would, I would never say that um, it is a defining factor. Yeah, I think that is a good conclusion, Richard. And thank you to Mr. C. Peckham for his input. Um, and actually, that brings us on to R star which you remember is the natural rate of interest. And Bloomberg Economics this week had a piece saying that they thought the natural rate of um, interest in the US had started to rise again. Now, reminder that over the last 10 years, the actual rate of interest has been far lower than the natural rate. And the reason they're saying the natural rate of interest has risen is that demographics so they're saying that uh, baby boomers are starting to retire and that will reduce the flow of savings and they agree that an aging population is inflationary so inflation should pick up as the baby boomers retire they also say cite deglobalization and frankly rising u.s debt so if they you break down their analysis here it's the fact 
that the US is running huge fiscal deficits to pay for, in part, social security and healthcare spending, which is precisely what we talked about in the previous section. It's a policy choice. Okay, and on to credit crisis watch, Richard. Thank you, Keith. Credit crisis seems to have just sort of disappeared into the background murmur, doesn't it, at the moment? Mm, it does. Uh, Actually, we should call this credit watch rather than credit crisis watch, but there you go. Credit crisis watch, question mark. Yeah. Credit crisis, question mark, watch. <laughs> anyway, so this is the um, regional banking ETF, which has uh, basically, since March, it's been relatively stable. And... Uh, Bank credit contract. Now that is obviously consistent with what we we're looking at with the SLUs. Yep. Um, senior loan officers. And so that's consistent, which is nice to see a bit of consistent data. Yeah, but actually a, a, a credit contraction is very rare. You know, it's only it really happened previously in the great financial crisis. The other recessions so for the 70s and early 90s, you didn't actually have a, a drop in bank credit. So the US economy is being extraordinarily resilient. Yeah. And junk bond spreads are not widening, which yeah. is interesting. People are very comfortable that the owners of junk bonds, which is most of the Russell 2000, if I remember correctly, uh, or certainly a large chunk of it, are nice, stable businesses. Well, many of them are loss making. We'll mm -hmm. see. There is some evidence of rising consumer credit stress. So the um this is you can see that the auto loans and uh, credit card uh, delinquencies are continuing to uh how have we got have we got quarter three data there yes we have yeah. i think we have yes yeah continues to rise in quarter three and actually mortgages mortgage um delinquencies is just starting to rise interestingly yeah a transition into serious delinquency which is 90 days plus for auto loans if you look at the this is this is dissected by age so demographically the youngsters are most likely to go into serious debt mm. and but everybody is moving into uh serious delinquency yeah and these are credit cards we're just showing this exactly the same pattern just yeah. we're, we're everywhere um credit card uh delinquency is rising all categories and the u.s credit impulse is continuing to fall and it's falling quite sharply and it hasn't actually done that outside a recession um commercial real estate debt outstanding is uh falling yeah so which means you know, well people are paying off their debt not taking out new debt and the real estate crisis has not definitely hasn't gone away because there's there's a huge problem with uh, office vacancies. Yeah, pause. Have a read. But you know, um, on Twitter there are lots of discussion of individual uh, properties being sold for frankly a, sh a fraction of their value of a few years ago, and all those losses have to be taken by someone. And the regional banks are in the firing line. Yeah. Consumer credit defaults rising, which we've just seen. So increasing consumer uh, stress there and the commercial real estate is, uh, is continuing to be a, a real concern. And it is likely to cause systemic issues because the amount of potentially delinquent debt there is enormous. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Richard. On to Inflation Watch. And we had new data for Germany this week. And um, inflation there continued to fall. And hopefully that is a harbinger for also better EU data when that comes out. So the UN Food and Agricultural Organization's Food Price Index has continued to fall in October. That's good news for everyone. Now, if you look at the number of retirees in the US, then there's an extra 2 million retirees above the trend following the pandemic. So one of the reasons we have inflation 
and high wage growth in the US is a tight labor market. Now, of course, we've talked about this before, that since um, 2019, the US has added 5 million immigrants. So actually, the US is solving its uh, labor problems by uh, just importing workers. It's uh, creating other problems, unfortunately. Yeah. Absolutely. Social problems, societal problems. Yep. Um, now, this is interesting. Pause, take a look at this. So the main chart shows wages, wage growth. And you'll see it has fallen very quickly, actually, from 7% at the start of the year to 4% now. And... The point is that according to the Phillips curve, which you remember relates um, inflation to the unemployment rate, we know that unemployment in, in the US has hardly changed at all. So the wage growth has fallen much sharper, much more quickly than you'd expect from the change in, in unemployment which is uh, interesting and suggests that uh, something else is going on or that the Phillips curve no longer applies. What would, um, what would happen if you took the Phillips, Phillips curve applied to Turkey? <laughs> yes, very good point. Yeah, I well, that's a very good point, Richard. Yeah, so uh, what you're essentially saying is that... Um, the fall in wage inflation is not just a function of the unemployment rate. It's a fu fu function of lots of other stuff. And I completely agree with that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is US rents falling year on year. And we know there's a hell of a lot of um, new apartment blocks under construction. The vacancy rate is rising. And that should mean rents continue to fall. Mm. Now, the ADP numbers, which were out last week, also had wage numbers attached to them. And they showed that uh, people who changed jobs were still getting uh, year on year wage growth of 8.4%, well down from its peak, but still very high. And job stairs still getting 5.7%, way too high for the Fed to be happy. Bloomberg, however, estimate that earnings growth is falling to around 4%. So lots of contradictory data. Pause, take a look at this. This is global data. Thank you to me, Mr. C. Peckham for sending this. Um, and what it shows is that the big drivers of manufacturing inflation over the last year were energy costs, and raw material costs, and actually demand not very large. And the labor costs, obviously, are partly a function of um, previous inflation is now fading. So demand at the bottom here has not been a big contributor to the fall, recent fall in manufacturing selling prices, i.e. the cyclical component has not really been responsible for the fall in uh, manufacturing prices. And if it higher interest rates now start to slow the, the, econo the economy, the global economy, then that means that that cyclical component should turn strongly negative and bring inflation down further, hopefully. But manufacturing prices have bounced recently because of the lagged effect of the bounce in energy prices and labor costs, but that should fade. And when we talk about cyclical and acyclical uh, components of inflation, this is from the US and this is the San Francisco Fed. And you'll see that so far, most of the fall in inflation has been due to acyclical components. The cyclical component is starting to turn down so hopefully all this adds up to inflation continuing to fall. So in summary, 
wage inflation. We have lots of contradictory data, still too high, whichever data series you look at. But inflation is coming down and it is likely to continue coming down. And that is good news. On to recession watch, Richard. What is the SAM rule, Keith? Okay, so we've talked about the SAM rule before. The SAM rule basically looks at the unemployment rate. And it says that an, a recession occurs when the <clears throat> unemployment rate rises by half a percentage or point or more relative to its low over the last 12 months. And its current reading is 0.33, i.e. the SAM rule is starting yeah. to look like it might predict a recession. It's inching up. It's inching up. Now, it has given a couple of false signals before, but they're quite rare. Most of the time, when it signals a recession, a recession duly arrives. The change in the US um, long-term unemployment rate is a very good recession indicator. And that is rising too, although it hasn't risen hugely yet, yet as we've discussed. So if unemployment continues to rise, both those indicators are going to start to say we have imminent recession, aren't they? Yeah. And um, Nordea forecasts the US unemployment will start to rise rapidly in the coming months. Uh, yes. On the... Uh, Nordea unemployment model, which actually looks pretty accurate going back many years. Yeah, you don't know. But the thing is, you don't know how much of this is in sample and out of sample, frankly. Yeah. So this, the red line shows is current unemployment rate. And the bands show the um, one or two standard deviations of the average unemployment rate in um, cycles. And you can see that the red line is actually sort of following the, the bands very roughly. So his question is the US unemployment rate starting to indicate recession. Yeah, I noticed, though, that, you know, it's the average of 1978 and 1980 cycles. 32, isn't it? Yeah. No more recent ones. What yeah, and you put the more recent ones in? Yeah, and you wonder whether they've been cherry picking a bit, mm -hmm. frankly. In case they're economists, they would never do that. <laughs> Trucking employment has been falling faster than in the past two recessions, although we have just seen the pickup in logistics. Yeah, I know. How do you reconcile that? Mm. With difficulty. California tech employment is falling rapidly. Um, yeah, no, that is falling fast, actually. Yeah. And uh, mortgage industry employees is falling. Yeah. But it's not at a particularly dangerous level. And average retail loan officer pay per month. So these these are not the slews; these are the jaloos, the junior loan officers. <laughs> well, actually, when you think about these uh, mortgage industry employees, they're staying employed, but they're making a lot less money than they it's were a couple of years ago. Bonuses, isn't it? Yeah. Well, presumably they get paid based on uh, commission, and they're just not signing many loans. No. And uh, the UK Employment Diffusion Index showing a uh, weakening, continuing yep. weakening, actually. So this um, this looks at you know the broad mass um, of the economy, and so the diffusion index is showing that it's weakening. Well, US youth unemployment actually is remarkably low, isn't it? But it is starting to move up. It is. And actually, quite sharply. Yeah. And mentions of weak demand are uh, rising. Yeah. Frequently and fast. And personal interest rates, payments even have risen. Well, we would have expected that. Um, okay. Um, actually, this, the next two charts, this chart and the next chart, are worrying. But I think they, they're very difficult to reconcile between the two of them. So this is um, personal interest payments as share of disposable income. Now, we know disposable income is between 20 and 25 percent of salary. And you'll see that it's risen from its low from like 1.5 percent to 2.75 percent. So an increase of 
1.25% of disposable income. And given that we know that disposable income is, say, 20% of salary, that would suggest it's risen by about 0.25% of total salary. But then this chart, non-mortgage interest payments as a share of salary, show it's risen by 2% of salary. So they both show a similar pattern, but this chart appears to show that rising interest rates are taking a huge chunk, well, actually a, a pretty big chunk out of people's uh, income. And this one shows a much, much smaller effect. But uh, once again, very contradictory data. You can say that rising interest rates are impacting US consumers, but frankly, not sure to what extent. The World Manufacturing Survey shows that the global PMI is continuing to fall and pretty low level. And it's doing much worse in advanced economies than in emerging markets. Emerging market actually is still above 50, whereas advanced economies are around about 45. <laughs> And uh, J.B. Morgan Global Composite Output Index is uh, falling, and they're suggesting the GDP is going to follow it down. Yep. Um, so you know, we've got rising U.S. long-term unemployment, which is suggesting is potentially indicative of a recession. We haven't quite got to the necessary rate of unemployment yet. And global manufacturing is already in a recession, but that is actually in developed markets, not in emerging markets. Yeah, on the uh, US unemployment, Richard, I think the pattern we are seeing is that no big increase in job losses, but people who are out of job are finding it very difficult to get a new one. And so mm -hmm. unemployment is rising, but it's rising very slowly. Yeah. And so the bad news is that means that the slowdown in the US economy is very slow, which means the, the Fed will keep interest rates high for a long part period until they get a response. And I'm afraid it's a long one this week because, well, I'm away next week and we've got a lot to discuss. Now, um, we've talked a lot about the US fiscal deficit. And thank you very much to the anonymous fund manager who sent me a Morgan Stanley report on the US fiscal deficit and very informative because the increase in the deficit is not what I expected. So this is the change in the deficit between 2022 and 2023. And you'll see that the increase in deficit was not caused by an increase in expenditure. Expenditure actually fell. What caused the increase in the deficit was a fall in revenues. So this is the change in revenues. And you'll see there's a huge drop in individual tax income. Payroll taxes actually increased, as you'd expect from a growing economy. Outlays increased. And there was this 177 billion increase in interest expenses, but that was more than offset by cuts in, is that the Department of uh, Education? Mm. And reduction in COVID expenditure. So the 2023 deficit, according to Morgan Stanley, widened by 0.9% from 5.4% in 2022 to 6.3% in 2023. Now, so that which was supported by GDP growth. So although the deficit widened, obviously the economy grew. So the uh, denominator grew. Hence, the deficit as a percentage of GDP only widened by 0.9%. So the reasons for the increase in the deficit were... Um, in part, 85 billion in tax revenues were transferred from 2023 to 2024 um, due to the storms in California and the uh, 
Californian citizens being allowed to defer their tax uh, payments to the current year and a huge drop in remittances from the Fed to the government because they're QE holdings. Now, reminder, during the pandemic, etc., the um, Fed was making huge profits and those profits were being sent to the uh, Treasury. Well, that is no longer the case. And also there was an 8.7 percent cost of living adjustment for Social Security payments in 2023. Going forward, the increase in cost of living adjustment will be much lower. So what that means is that Morgan Stanley expect the fiscal deficit to narrow slightly to 6.1% in 2024, which is still terrible from 6.3% in 2023. The deficit will actually rise slightly, but because they're expecting GDP to continue growing, as a percentage of GDP, it will fall. Now, there is a downside risk to the fiscal deficit, so, i.e. a risk it could shrink if lawmakers fail to pass full year appropriations for departments by the 1st of January, because then the Fiscal Responsibility Act means that the president is required to wish an executive order cutting expenditure by 1% across the board. And if they did that, the deficit would fall by, sadly, only 20 basis points from 6.1% to 5.9%. State and local government expenditures have also peaked. I thought this was interesting. This is um, total payrolls for state and local government. And you see that they are still far below their pre-pandemic trend. Everyone is currently worried about the path of the fiscal deficit, but the gray line is the projected US primary deficit as of now, June uh, 2023. It's actually much better than it was either last year or the year before. So actually the path of the US primary deficit has actually improved over the last few years. And that means the projections for federal debt have also improved. But of course, rising yields mean that the cost of servicing the national debt has got worse. So previously, when interest costs have hit this level, the result has been cuts in the budget and austerity will the government actually do that this time so bottom line is um the u.s fiscal deficit has probably peaked for now and will contract next year which means uh, will contract all else being equal i should say which means that the fiscal impulse will actually be negative and should detract from gdp growth rather than the other way around and on to Good news. So good news. This is Indonesia. And at the bottom here, you can see a palm oil plantation. Now, over the last few years, you've had a lot of illegal palm oil plantations, which have been set up in basically protected areas and national parks because Indonesia has, has failed to enforce the laws. Well, so the president has pledged to return to rainforest 200,000 hectares of illegal palm oil plantations. That's about half a million acres, 780 square miles or two times Hong Kong. So let's hope they follow through and the rainforest starts to heal in Borneo. And on to equities, Richard. So the World Equity Index is up a little bit last week. Uh, the FTSE was up an even smaller bit last week. FTSE, sorry, the FTSE all share. Still in a sort of decline, really, isn't it? Long, medium term decline. Mm. Uh, the Euro stocks, um, surprisingly up, actually, given what we think is happening in the European economy. Yeah, and rising interest rates. Amazing. Yeah. 
and the S&P 500 is doing its own thing, basically. Yeah, very strong bounce. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, it's the recent lows. Yeah, and the NASDAQ is also doing its own thing. Up 30% on the year. Yeah, yeah extraordinary. So the Russell 2000 is actually behaving more in line with what I would expect it to be doing. Um, and um, mm. you know, I think it has a lot of economically sensitive companies in it. And if the US economy slows down considerably, the Russell 2000, will, we would expect it to be not for six, actually. Yeah, but also, you know, the smaller companies in the US, they're um, dependent for financing on banks and they actually have to pay um, higher interest rates, whereas the S&P 500 companies have locked in long-term rates by issuing bonds during the pandemic. So yeah. rising interest rates are absolutely affecting the Russell 2000 companies, not yeah. really affecting the S&P 500 ones. Yeah, very true, Keith. Uh, the Hang Seng, is, again, it doesn't look healthy, does it? It's just a sort of deteriorating trend for the year. And the topics is, uh, well, you know, the Japanese have still got yield curve control, so I presume the topics is um, mm. somewhat. I mean, how much the Japanese government owns an awful lot of the topics, doesn't it? I forget all the numbers. Really? Is. Yeah. But um, basically, this flip side of the, the currency going through the floor. Yeah. You know, the currency is down a third in the last two two years. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin's had a bit of a run up this uh, this week, this month. Yeah. And, um, up 6% on the week. And the pound is um, doing nothing particularly remarkable, I would say, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, the, as the euro is doing nothing particularly remarkable. And the dollar index is doing nothing. I mean, one of the things, these look like big swings, but the scale on the right-hand side is not particularly large, although the 5 well, the 7% move actually from July to September was a big move. Mm. Now, I guess it's being digested. It's all quite, it's quite volatile, isn't it? The VIX is... Uh... Absolutely shocking. VIX is yeah. just amazingly low. Yeah. Yeah, basically the, the markets, despite incredible volatility in the bond markets and actually the equity markets, the uh, VIX, i.e. options, are not pricing in volatility ahead. Yeah. We've shown this chart before, but it's continuing to get worse, really. The, the, the jaws are opening the mm. differential between the 10-year Treasury and the S&P 500 um, is, is getting wider. Yeah. And analysts are continuing to expect strong S&P 500 earnings growth. Next year, yeah. Amazing. I mean, they're expecting 12% growth. Yeah. Hmm. Hum. At some stage, and I predicted this many times, Richard, and yes. failed, <clears throat> we expect earnings to disappoint and equity stage, to take a bath. At some stage, they'll be wrong and we'll be right, Keith. <laughs> yes. <coughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and this is suggesting that the recession is already over. And uh, quarter three earnings have been strong, and uh, very strong, actually. But quarter four earnings are being downgraded. Yeah. Which is interesting. Mm. They're playing the usual game, probably, of, of talking it down so they can beat them. But it's interesting they're downgrading them. Yeah, isn't it just, yeah. And quarter four revenue expectations have fallen quickly. And that is a as a a uh, quite yeah. big differential there between quarter three estimate and quarter four estimate. Yep. Earnings revision breadth is rolling over, so negative earnings revisions are becoming more common. And the percentage of US small cap stocks um, not making any profit in the last three years. Um, it's a that's a you know, a worrying curve, isn't it, in terms of the health of, of, of a big chunk of the US economy? Well, I think, you know, this is a function of zero interest rates, Richard. You know, basically lots of speculative tech companies with potential earnings far in the future got um, IPO'd yeah. between like 2015 and uh, 2020. And now, unless they start getting revenue soon, I think they're going to find funding difficult. 
financing costs are going up even for the S&P 500. And um, that is a, um, it's becoming a key risk in delayed projects. Yeah. So we have European earnings already in recession. Um, yeah. But the stocks, uh, Euro stocks is up on the year. I don't get it. I mean, I think uh, a lot of this is to do with expectations that central banks will restart QE at some point. Who is who's going to blink first, isn't it? Mm. Um, and European companies are actually most are the most downbeat since the last recession. Interest, uh, US banks continuing to underperform the S and P five hundred, uh, even though interest rates are moving in their favour. Mm. I think you know you don't want to be investing in banks right now. Yeah, I agree. The time to sell your board eight shares was was eighteen months ago. So board eight was this non fungible token. It was was it a picture of a, I mean, it was a ridiculous thing, wasn't it? And um, it was just uh, I, I I I can't define what it was apart from people losing touch with reality. No, I completely agree. But it was amazing. So. Trading in non-fungible tokens reached 4.9 billion in January 22. <laughs> this month, it was 49 billion, 49 million. So what's that? Is that 1%? It's 0.1. Yeah, one, yes. 1%. Yeah. yeah, idiocy. And thank you, Richard, on to commodities and energy commodities. And oil had a shocker. Um, so earlier in the week, Oil was doing okay as um, Russia and Saudi reiterated their commitment to cuts and then sold off hard, down almost 8% on the week for Brent, down 8% for WTI. And the commentary is that is the um, security premium due to the war in um, the Gaza Strip coming out of the oil price. But frankly, that's just not the case. It's far lower than when um, Hamas attacked Israel. And so that has to be concerns about global demand. Now, funnily enough, we don't have any EIA data this week. They haven't published anything. We did have the uh, Baker Hughes rig count, and that fell 8 to 496, down 125 on the year. But although oil prices have fallen hard this week, Global oil inventories appear to be still falling. So at some stage, their inventories will need to be restocked and that'll support the oil price. Natural gas in Europe was uh, subdued down 3.4% this week because EU gas storage levels are at a record high for this time of year due to the warmer start to the winter. And I found this absolutely amazing. So this is German industrial production by sector. And the energy crisis in Europe has caused energy intensive industries in Europe, in, sorry, in Germany, to collapse. So chemicals is the yellow line. That's down almost 30%. Other energy intensive industries down 20%. And those trends do not look happy. So the very high energy prices in Europe have caused essentially deindustrialization. Can I just um, remind everyone, when we first started doing this podcast, Keith, I think there was a mini crisis with Italian bonds, wasn't there? That, that yeah. They were spiking up. And also that was going on three years ago now. And one of the st stabilizing factors was the German economy. Yeah. <laughs> so UK natural gas futures also down slightly on the week. US natural gas futures, having had a nice recovery from the lows, had a very bad week, down 14%. Coal bounced a bit, but it's still down almost 70% on the year. Uranium, is that topping out? No, it's not. It's just taking a breather before going up much, much more, Keith. <laughs> in fact, you forgot to put the dotted line in. No, you can do that mentally, Richard. I'm sure you have. 
This is a chart showing the relative cost of different energy systems. And nuclear is carbon free, reliable, base load power, and it's cheap. Why on earth aren't we building much more of it? Germans must be wishing they built more nuclear power, mustn't they? <laughs> They'll be importing all their electricity from France, I'm sure, Richard. Yeah. No, they won't they won't bother importing it, Keith. You know what they'll do. <laughs> They'll just they'll roll over the border one day. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I won't cut that out, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on to industrial metals, Richard. Uh, so um aluminium. Is uh, a little bit down on the week. It's doesn't, not really moving very much at the moment. And uh, cobalt, uh, same as it has been for the last three months, four months. Yeah, dead. Yeah, copper is uh, it, it, nothing's very much moving at the moment. It's like there's a bit of a bit of a limbo, isn't there? People, yeah, want to see what's happening. Some slow, some slow down, some increases. Um, chromium, likewise, not a lot to report. Iron ore as is showing a bit of um liveliness actually. And um Keith has put in a note at the top, which is quite interesting. And uh, yeah, and actually I'm gonna read this out if you don't mind, Richard. Yeah. Prices for iron ore cargoes with a 63.5% iron ore content for delivery in Tianjin jumped to the $127 mark, the highest in seven months, carried by renewed hopes that economic stimulus from the Chinese government will create added demand. Beijing announced it will accelerate the issuance of sovereign bonds after widening its budget deficit to accommodate an additional one trillion yuan in debt targeting steel heavy infrastructure and manufacturing projects. The developments magnify previous signals from lenders, miners and metallurgists that robust demand for infrastructure in China is expected to offset the debt crisis for the residential construction sector, maintaining active purchasing activity for iron ore input puts mm. so there you have it uh lithium still on its sort of slow gentle decline really yeah uh, down 6.1 percent on the week and down 70 percent on the year yeah uh, neodymium unchanged on the week nickel just on a long-term decline at the moment Tin up four percent on the week. Not very remarkable. Ferro vanadium actually unchanged on the week, but significantly down on the year. Yeah, dead. Yeah. And zinc is not very much, not doing anything particularly exciting. So on to the precious metals. It wasn't such a good week for the precious metals. Gold down 1.7%, still up 7.2% for the year. Silver, very slightly down on the week and down 5% on the year. And platinum down 7% on the week, down 20% on the year. Yeah, the um, catalytic converter metals are having a shocker. Yeah. Rhodium actually kicked up 8%, but 63% down on the year. And palladium, well, down 13% in on the week, which is a big yeah. drop. Yeah, not good. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Richard. On to rates. And the yield curve continued to shift down this week. Great news. Um, for everything, basically, as I think the markets are seeing a peak in rates and also starting to see a slowdown or discount a slowdown in economies. The US yield curve has shifted down much less than the UK one, perhaps reflecting the fact that the US economy is much more resilient. Now, the market is becoming more confident in its call for rate cuts this year. And so these are the expected interest rates in January 25. And you'll see over the last month, expectations have dropped. <clears throat> but the market is expecting 
shallow recessions and only a gradual decline in interest rates. Let's see. I expect them to cut drop much faster than this. Now, the rise in rates, according to Bloomberg, has been all to do with rising growth expectations. But I think the events of yesterday um, where rates rose very sharply on a failed US 30-year bond auction show that actually concerns over liquidity and the market being able to digest the huge US bond issuance um, are what is causing the rise in US rates, certainly. And world rates are pricing off US rates. And shout out to our Discord member, Uncle Tom, who's been saying this for months, and I've been sceptical, but it looks like he was right. But if you look at bond, um, central banks around the world, well, actually, they've started cutting. The proportion who have started cutting rates is rising. So has the rising cycle mm. peaked? Mm. This is the UK two-year Actually, steady downward trend, I'd say. The 10-year, I don't think you can say a downward trend yet, but hopefully we have peaked. 30-year, the same. US 10-year, big bounce, but well down from peak. German. So this chart shows the increase in debt for the four main European economies indexed to 2000. And so historically, we've all been concerned about Italy. Well, Italian debt has grown in line with German debt. Spanish and French debt has grown much faster. And of those, I think we should really be concerned about French debt. French debt was already high. Spain's debt to GDP started off much lower and the French debt has continued to rise and is rising at a relentless pace. And France is too big to bail out. And this is the Italian 10 year and the Greek. Any change to your views, Richard? No, no change to my views, Keith, I think. Um, yeah, I would um, stick with mine. OK, on to concluding comments. Well, numbers out this morning show the UK economy outperformed expectations in Q3 by stagnating as opposed to contracting. We're good at something, Richard. <laughs> but falling business investment and construction orders in Q3 suggest weakness ahead. Yeah. Now, we also had US non-farm payrolls. They're the big data point of the week. And they suggest that wage growth and the jobs market in the US is slowing, but it's slowing very slowly. And the US economy is slowing, but very gradually. Um, that means that interest rates are likely to stay higher for longer until wage growth, which is way too high, comes back down to within range. Richard, what did you get up to this week? Nothing, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, nothing. I didn't, uh, didn't no, no purchases, no sales. Sat on my hands, which are getting uh, pins and needles from all being sat on for so long. <laughs> but, yeah, I was... Uh, yeah. How about you? Did you do anything? Okay, thank you, Richard. I had a better week, up 3.3%. Uh, I'm still having an absolutely terrible year. And quite frankly, the um, you know long bonds are still lower than my absolute worst case scenario. So not great, really. Um, and obviously, I've been dead wrong so far, but I've got a feeling things are starting to go my way. Touch fingers wood, crossed. fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you all very much for watching. Very long episode this week as we're away next week. Normal service will resume in two weeks' time. In the meantime, thank you all for watching. Please can you press like and subscribe to the channel. And it's goodbye from Richard Wheater. Thank you.
And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.